Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're all very welcome along. Ken is my name. You know me well by now. Uh, just a few little uh, matters. Housekeepers on soil. I'm just checking that I'm, uh, I'm doing following these procedures. So, the kids tell me if I look at the side of the iPhone, I can see a little kind of orange kind of light. I'm on soil, and so I must be kind of doing something now. So I'm only getting the hang of this thing. And uh, as you know, in event of any uh, emergency, we have to leave the building or something. Just follow me up the steps and to the left, okay? As fast as you possibly can. Now, there's none of this women and children forced to run here, okay? This, it's every man for himself, every man and woman for him and for self, I should say. Uh, the back of the hall there, just for the door with the boxes back there for editions. As you know, there's no membership, there's no membership fee for the, being a member of the Histor Hysterical Society, as you all are. And uh, that's our main source of income. We already have a full program in place for uh, the, uh, the for our next season of lectures, and it's a, a very full, full and varied uh, lecture series that we have. Mark, thank you for that's well on the way anyway, and that to be ready for you. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ronald Sheen here. Ronald Sheen, folks, going to give us a, a talk on the Book of Kells. I'm sure you've all seen the Book of Kells at some stage. I pass by it maybe five times each and every day, leaving off tours to go in. The throngs, the thousands of people go in there, never, ever, ever ceases to amaze. It's wrong with Shane, folks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me say uh, thank you to the committee of the Town of Historical Society, specifically Anne um, there, and um, Harry Walsh, uh, for inviting me along uh, to talk to you. Um, I'm a professional two things. I'm a writer and a solicitor, and especially I have yeah, what's called copyright or intellectual property law. And I'm possibly going to say a little bit about that as it relates to the Book of Kells. What is the Book of Kells? Well, here is a book about the Book of Kells, which is brought out before. Uh, Christmas, and it's by Bernard Meehan, who is the keeper of scripts in Trinity College Dublin. He's had more access to the Book of Kells than anybody else, and he's, a, he's, he's an expert on it in many respects. So I'll, I'll just flick through it so you can just see it, see pictures from it. I hope I'm in the best position. I'm sorry, I should, I should really have all this on the screen, but I'm not, I'm not very good at that point. Uh, all the different colours. Features versus the Book of Kells. It's the four Gospels. That, and the, the Gospels are in Latin. I'm involved in the Irish, in, in the Dublin version of the European Centre for Latin, which is one of my interests in this. Okay. It's got different colours, different design motifs. Little animals who appear. Uh, you have different figures representing Christ or his followers. These pages here have to do with um, the genealogies that appear in the Gospels sometime. The design of the book is it's it's Celtic, indeed Irish, and it's considered one of the great works of art of all time. Uh, it's the most famous book in Dublin. I can talk about Jade's. You can talk about Patrick Cavanagh. There's nothing to touch the book again. It has been, since its, its composition virtually, it's peculiarly the property of Irish people. But it's, it is regarded as an expression of the sovereignty of the people. That means its independence. Sovereign is the moment. There's nobody above the sovereign. There's nothing above the book of chaos. So here's the page of the, of the text of the gospel, and here is the is the um, the words and so forth. And um, the most famous, I often think I'll just say Joanne that when you look at the, the, the figures in the book of chaos, they're obviously Irish. They look like the people down the bar that you were with yesterday and shouldn't have been. <laughs> they turn up in the book of chaos. So Irish people, have, they're very simple, you can identify them like that. The most famous um, uh, page, perhaps, 
is this page. And this is called the Chi Rho page. Well, there's two words, two letters of the Chi, which is a Greek letter for CH, which is the first letter of the word Christ. Okay. And then Rho is the kind of the word for or Romans. And it's very hard to see because you have to really look into it. Uh, but that's what it is then. So it's, it's, it's for the people who made this. Here they are, they're saying something that for them would have been virtually unutterable. It's the word of God. It's, it's saying God. In those days they believed in God. And this was for God. So that wonderful, complicated, intricate, intricate interweaving of, of motifs is intended to approximate. And you can see the head of the guy there. Okay. Um, now, where was the Book of Kells made? The Book of Kells, well, first of all, it was made probably around the, around, let's say, it was made around the years, the late, late 700s, early 800s. And it was probably begun on the island of Iona, which is off the west coast of Scotland. That was a Columban or monastery founded by St. Colum Killa in the 6th century. So it had been there for about three or 400 years. And that's the founding of the monastery is something which I'm going to come back to later. Um, it was probably begun there and it was likely brought to Kells or finished in Kells around the same time. Why? Because at that stage the Vikings, people who found Dublin, well, supposedly found the Dublin area, the Vikings attacked Iona. Iona wasn't a military opposite place, it was, a, it was a religious place, and the, 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 the Vikings sacked it and slaughtered the monks a couple of times. To protect the book and themselves, they went to Kells in County Neve, which was also a Columban foundation. Colin Killer had founded Kells also. Um, Harry was saying to me recently that there's a holy well near here which is associated with St. Colin Killer and his feast date on the 6th of June. So, um, there Top is. of Ballycullen Road opposite or uh, the Augustinian. Okay, but well, then this here tala therefore would have been part of that system of monasteries and foundations which included Kells, Iona, and others in Scotland and in, in the north of England. I'm going to come back to that, but firstly, let's follow the book. Um, I think, I think technically, it, it, it's the fact that he was supposed to have stopped off of the well rather than actually had found a monastery. Okay, that's fair enough. He didn't find the monastery, but it's associated with him. Yes, very much. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, in, we know the, the book is referred to in medieval times by by a number of people. It's, it's referred to in the Annals of Austin. It's also referred to by the writer Geraldus Cambrensis, who was a Welsh writer who came to Ireland with Henry II in 1210. In this phrase about it, which is quoted to wit, it seemed like the work of angels rather than people. It seemed like it had this sacred potency about it. Um, later on, in, we know that in, in, uh, in uh, Kells, don't forget too, Kells is, is, is situated specifically very close to Tower. So Tower is where the High King was. Kells is where the church is. So it's, it's related to the High King of Ireland. The next thing is that we know that from pages at the back of the book that in medieval times land transactions in Kells were recorded in the book, which may seem to us uh, uh, rather bad, but we know that lawyers are capable of any kind of desecration. <laughs> then there's no. Um, that also would take a, that is useful from the point of view of placing the book in Kells, so we can say how long the book was in Kells. The book was then we, we move on and where the Book of Kells comes to uh, 
difficulties of, is around the time of the Reformation and the suppression of the monasteries. When all monasteries basically were suppressed by Henry the Eighth. And it seems then that the Book of Kells went into the possession of the Plunkett family, who would have been ancestors of Joseph Mary Plunkett of 1916. Um, and it was in Cromwellian times that the Book of Kells finds its way to Trinity College. Um, Trinity have a line on how they got it. They like to present, represent that it, they got it legitimately. I don't think they did get it legitimately. Um, they say that it was given to them by a Bishop Jones of Meath, who for safekeeping passed the book to Trinity. The Bishop Jones was actually scout master in Cromwell's army. Uh, Cromwell had devastated Meath. He slaughtered the women of Drogheda in the vault of the cathedral there. They'd driven Catholics west of the Shannon for the purposes of Tehera Connacht. Mm -hmm. They had rounded up approximately 50,000 Irish people and branded them in Bristol and sold them as slaves to the Barbados. It's interesting to note, this is a friend of mine who asked me recently, that Rihanna, a singer, mm -hmm. She's descended from those Irish women. She's, 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 she's descended to the Irish slaves. <coughs> and um, so, therefore, to, to, as I put it in my, in my essay, it's impossible to imagine how legal title in intellectual property, real property, could pass through the hands of Henry Jones. Because his business was to loot and feed on a destructed culture and country. And in my view, therefore, uh, um, Trinity acquired the book wrongfully. Does that mean that they, wrong, they have it wrongfully now? Well, that's a more complicated question. In law, they would have what is called a, what's called a possessory title. Because they've been, been in possession of it for 500 years or so, mm -hmm. no, it's, 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 it's 400 years, it would be hard to find somebody with a better title. It's like adverse possession of it. The Irish people are sovereign. The Irish people can make a law to say, by the way, we want that book. If they choose, or whatever, whatever, whatever might be, uh, that people might feel is the appropriate thing. And of course, I'm. I, 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 I support the people of Kells in their endeavours to get the book back to Kells. Um, now, there's another d dimension to this which I want to, 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 to open to you um, um, slightly. And it's you this. say the book is sovereign and Trinity College have it, whether they have it rightly or wrongly. Mm. Uh, a number of years ago, they wanted to try. People wanted to try and move it to Kells, but they wouldn't come off. Mm. And I honestly believe I was working there at the time, mm. and I honestly believe at the time it was a revenue gathering situation. They let it go, and massive amount of revenue went there. And I think that revenue was wrong, which we put into the state for education, rather than into Trinity Congress. Because if you take it out, people won't go into the long run, but they certainly are not going to pay six and seven euros. Yeah. Well, I I agree with you. Um, some some time ago, um, I used to act for the National Museum in these nights. Um, some time ago, uh, it was suggested to Charlie Poppy when he was Taoiseach that there should be a charge on entrance to the National Gallery. And Charlie Hawley said, why should the Irish people have to pay for looking at something they already own? If the Irish people own the Book of Kells, why should they have to pay for looking at it? What proportion of the visitors are Irish? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Well, my fear would be that it could be relatively small if one was to leave out I would like to say the enforced visitation of school children. Mm. You know, uh, yeah. unfortunately. 
In other words, that in reality it, it, it's tourists who, who are paying to see. And I would think were to do a proportion of this, I, I would imagine the tourists. We, we tend to visit galleries elsewhere when we're not allowed yeah. to well, you don't. I'm going to come back to that. Um, that's a good point. But let me come back to that. Just, if you just bear with me for a second. This has a material um, bearing on how the Book of Kells came about in the first place, and that is the story of how Colum Killer went to Iona in the first place, and that's a story about a discover copy, <laughs> and it goes like this. It's a wonderful law story. And it's the oldest copyright case in Western Europe by a thousand years. We're talking, say, about the time when Ireland was a sovereign country. Ireland made law. Yeah. Colin Kelly goes to a monastery at Drummin in County Louth. And the monastery belongs to St. Finian, who's a famous teacher. St. Finian has a book. It's a, what's called a Psalter. That means Psalms. And Colum Killer wants to see the sounds, but he waits until after Mass and when Finian is gone. So he doesn't ask Finian's permission. He is given the sounds and he makes a copy of them, right? When Finian discovers this, he's pretty cross and says, You shouldn't have done that. That was my book, and therefore the copy you made should be mine. Colum Killer says, We have to go to the High King of Ireland to, to, to resolve this dispute. The High King was the supreme legal authority. So they go to Tara, and Finian makes the case that I've just outlined, and Colin Killer says this nobody, is in, nobody can stop the word of God, which is in the Psalms. Secondly, you can't stop me or anybody else copying them, therefore. Second, I didn't do any damage to Fidian's book. In other words, he didn't damage the original. And third, if I get any benefit from this, it's going to go to the people. Okay? So that's what Colin Killer said. The, the High King uh, disagreed with Colin Killer and he made a judgment that it's, it's a really famous... <laughs> famous phrase. He said, to every cow it's calf, to every book it's copy. In Irish, it's le a abunim, it's le gopliar a machliar. Colin Killer said, that is an unjust judgment and you will be punished for it. <laughs> that sounds like the kind of thing you'd hear in a bar every day of the week, right? <laughs> but in fact there's more to it than that. He was Speaking in from the Breton laws, pre-Anglo-Irish laws, pre-Common law, the Irish laws. And central to the Irish concept of law was that the king was, especially as he gave law, was like representing God on earth. And if the king got it wrong, the whole society was askew. So, Colin Killer is an O'Donnell of Donegal. He goes to back to him, Tyr Connell or Tyr Owen, and he raises an army. The army marches against Dyrid, and Dyrid is defeated at Cudrena in County Sligo. Copyright. And Colin Killer's victory affirms that what he said was the law. But he, um, it wasn't. He, he he could have become high king, but. He wasn't interested in that, and also the religious the people of Ireland decided that Colum Killer had caused bloodshed, so he had to be banished for the battle. So it's a sophisticated story. It's about copyright, it's about battle, it's about moral right and wrong. Anyway, Colum Killer goes to Iona, and he founds his monastery there and he takes various followers with him. And from there, he really establishes Christianity in the north of England and in Scotland. Like the Church of Scotland, for example, derives from St. Colin Killen, or a 
as the explorer in his Latin name, Saint Columba. Um, now, I'm going to make um, a, a little skip. Take what Colin Killer said about the Word of God. Everybody is entitled to copy the Word of God. If everybody is entitled to copy the Psalms, everybody is entitled to copy the Gospels. The Book of Kells is known in Irish as Yawr Colum Killer, Colum Killer's Book. It was made before the introduction of the common law. So wouldn't you think Colum Killer's principles should apply to Colum Killer's book? How could you charge money for looking at the Gospel? Shouldn't everybody be entitled to make copies of it, not just the cosy friends of the Provost of Trinity College? <laughs> I'm sure he's a fine person, but... <laughs> what do they do with the money? Um, they get rather a lot of money, and I'm sure it goes to, to, to bursaries and salaries for scholars. I think the children of Kells could probably do it some of it. So there's, a, there's, there's, um, there's, there's an injustice there, in my view. Um, one other, there's a couple of other points I'd like to make, but it's, one is, 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 is that I'm fond of is this, that the Trinity College was, was set up by Queen Elizabeth, among other things, to to kind of destroy papists now, which is like basically to destroy the Catholics. And the Book of Kells is the epitome of the very culture that she was setting out to destroy. It's ironic that so many hundred years later, the, the most Catholic of Catholic books is used to sustain the university. Yeah. Um, Trinity is not, it, I mean, it's, Trinity now is not quite the same thing as it was in 1598, and it has different traditions in it. However, that constitution, I, I believe, remains. On this, there's two other things, at least I'd like to say in relation to this. A thing that is, I believe is hard um, for Irish people to <coughs> grasp is the idea of the sovereignty of the country, right? uh, meaning the whole island, right? and its sovereignty and its independence of culture and so forth. Um, and how that, that, something like that threatens our, our, our opponents, as it were. An analogy that I feel is appropriate for the theft of the Book of Kells is the theft of the Kohai Noor diamond of the Sikhs by the British Army General Gough in 1848, when, when the, the British, after a long struggle, defeated the Sikhs of northwest India and took over the Punjab, which they quickly turned into a, a money making milk cow. The Sikhs had this symbol of their sovereignty, which was a diamond, the Kohai Noor diamond. And General Gough removed it and it passed it on to Queen Victoria. What picture is here? Actually, it's not a very good picture. Forget about it. Um, so, to, to, um, it's interesting that when Queen Victoria came to Dublin, she was invited. This is, I'm not quite sure what year it was, maybe 1850 or something. She was invited to sign the Book of Kells, to write her name on it, and the prince as well. Why? Because it was a symbol of so Irish sovereignty. Every, all sovereignty had to be British. There was no possibility of an expression, an independent expression of Irish sovereignty. That's my, that's my interpretation yeah. as to why they did that. Okay? Okay, there's one other um, um, thing that I just... I just wanted, uh, which is about, okay, it's my hobby horse, it's copyright law, right? but it's this. If you remember, in, in, uh, oh yeah, has anybody here ever go to the pictures, the movies? 
Yes. What's the first thing you see? Yeah. It's a threat to put you in jail <laughs> for making a, you know, an illegal copy of the film. You're going to go to jail. Imagine if I came into this room and I had on my jacket, if you steal this jacket, you will go to jail. Or if you steal this shirt, you will go to jail. Right? It's just a piece of property, right? Yes, that's put on it, right? That's a threat to jail you. That's a penal sanction for what? Penal. Okay? What's happened is that the Motion Picture Association of America, big people like the Disney Corporation, the Warner Brothers, have persuaded us by sleight of hand to turn what is a matter of civil law into criminal law. <coughs> Remember Colin Killer? He says, I didn't damage the original book. Right? Dermot, but Fillion still has a sense. Colin Killer hadn't damaged it. <coughs> hadn't gone over it. <coughs> Larceny means I take something from you. Absolutely. Copyright is where I might infringe the right, if you have it, to copy something. That's a matter of civil law. Well, it was. So, if I make a copy of a film, I don't take away the original film. I haven't stolen anything. There's no larceny. There might be an inf if the film, if the film if, 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 assuming that they have copyright in it, then, okay, I, I might infringe a right. But then they should sue me for damages. Supposing the film was only worth 2p. Okay, so... My point here is this, that Colum Killer's law, and incidentally, the High Court in Dublin recently ruled that indeed it was a law, not a story. Colum Killer's law makes that distinction between the original and the copy. And what the people like the Disney Corporation and the really powerful American companies are doing is they're trying to turn us over and getting the police to collect money for them. It's called imperialism. The most influence in our country and indeed the Netherlands are always anxious to persuade us that the only law is American law or English law. In the world of copyright, there are at least two other streams of law which are as nearly, well, pretty much as old as Colin Killers, perhaps. One is Muslim law. And I recently used, and um, I have it, I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but I have it here. Uh, you'll be amused to hear that, you, you, I'm sure many people here will remember Bob Geldof and Live Aid. Oh, yeah. mm. In 2000, what, what year was it? 1985. 85. The, 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 the Muslims of Indonesia had never heard of copyright until Bob Geldof came along and told them all he owed them loads, they owed them loads of money. Because what happened was that the, the Live Aid people, they produced a record and lots of copies of it were circulated around Indonesia and Bob wasn't getting any money. A holiday boycott? Ancient Irish tactic? Did they have copyright law? They didn't. They were Muslims. Ideas came from God. They weren't commodities. So you couldn't sell them. So the Muslims, the, the Indonesians then came under pressure, of course, to join the club. Another bunch of people are called the Chinese. The Chinese had a printing industry long before the English did. Long before the Gutenberg Bible was invented. They invented paper and printing. They didn't think ideas were commodities. The intellectuals there said, in matters of calligraphy, we do not charge a fee. In other words, this is for nothing. And it's only quite recently that the Chinese have been persuaded by the Americans that they really should think differently about copyright law, that they should pay them for stuff. The first time copyright came into China was in 1908. It was accompanied by the British fleet. <laughs> that was the argument that they produced. It was warship. Um, another... I hope I don't sound like I'm getting too heated or <laughs> over the top. 
um, more recently, and something which, which, which might uh, concern us as Irish people more, is this. In um, 1998, I think it was, I might have it wrong, the, the, um, there was an act for the purposes of circulating videos in Ireland. And that was accompanied by the setting up of a group called Irish National Fight Against Copyright Theft. The Irish people hadn't asked for it. But there was no such thing as theft. Probably the handiwork of the Disney Corporation, who wanted the police to collect money for them. And under that, the um, a various legal apparatus was put in place to arrest people who, who, who allegedly were infringing or stealing the copyright of the big American companies. At the same time, there was a woman in County Meath called, I think her name was Denise Ryan. County Meath, the territory of Irish copyright law. Denise wanted to make a TV series called Piggly Poo. She was from a farm and she had little pigs. And she wanted to make a series called Piggly Poo. The Disney Corporation said, you can't. Poo belongs to us. <laughs> We own the rights to Winnie the Pooh, therefore you cannot use the word poo. So it's a, word, it's a dispute over the word, which means shit. <laughs> the Disney Corporation had larger resources than Denise. They've got infinite resources. The Disney Corporation can make, get the fundamentals of copyright law changed in America. You need a lot of clout to do that. And, um, Denise, however, was a lady of the county Meath, and she wasn't going to be cowed. So she, she stuck her, her, to her guns, and ultimately was vindicated by a decision of the European Court in Alicante after 10 years, which the Disney Corporation had tried to ruin her, with one lawsuit after another, and break her, basically. So even when she won, however, um, it turned out she couldn't use the word piggly poo, because Disney would have boycotted everybody who took Who invented boycotting? I think we did. So now they're using our tactics against us? So, um, um, Denise had to, 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 she, she, she developed a series called Piggly Wings. So Pooh was left to Disney to do with what they wished to do. Because her life was going to be miserable. Because Disney was remorseless, unrelenting, savage. And as a lawyer, I find it outrageous that anybody associated with Disney, therefore, in this country, should get an injunction. Because an injunction is based on the rules of equity and justice. And if you are yourself in, in a bad way or in a bad spirit, you shouldn't be given the benefit of justice. So how could they get an injunction? Puzzles. Um, also, wasn't there a group called Irish National Fight Against Copyright Theft? Weren't they there to represent Denise? No, they weren't there to represent Denise. They were there to help Disney. Am I saying it is? I'm not saying that, no. It probably is true. Uh, what I'm saying is that it's a huge corporation. And huge corporations can be oppressive. I'm not saying that everything that Disney does is therefore bad. Um, but I will sign out on one um, copyright note. Um, one of my ancestors... Uh, was a man called Henry Grattan Curran. He was a son of John Fitbot Curran, and he wrote a version of the song Green. Mm. Everybody know that? Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't, it's usually it's not named for him. And anyway, he didn't own copyright in it, because there was various versions of it. And his sister, Amelia Curran, made a copy of a, a, of a painting in the Vatican called The Madonna Boen by Murillo. And that's on display in the um, 
the Church of St. John the Baptist in Black Rock, which was put up there by her friend Lord Clon Curry. There's no copyright question. Funnily enough, though, the Virgin is wearing green. <laughs> and the other day, I found somebody else who was wearing green. I took a photo. Mickey Nuts. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> what then should happen to the book of clouds? Where, where should it, should I, how should we get it away from the evil, evil ones? I think it should be, I think it should go to Kells when um, there is a good plan for from Kells as to what to do with it. I think that it should be done by the Dolan. I think the Irish people should claim that they own this piece of work unequivocally, and this is what they want to do with it. There are arguments, of course, I mean, many people feel in good faith that it should be left in Trinity. Excuse me. Okay, there's, there's valid arguments for that. I feel that the arguments for returning it to Kells are much more persuasive and really exciting. I think in a time of national recession and depression, the idea of the Book of Kells returning to Kells would be psychologically such an uplift. That's my view. And, um, but it, it, sh, it sh... Does that answer your question? Well, why do, what justification did Trinity put forward for keeping the book? Um, they, <laughs> they are very timid when they're asked directly. And in fact, they're getting more wobbly, I think, at the moment as to why. Yeah. They say, well, it was given to us for safekeeping, therefore they legitimately got it. We've had it for 500 years, we've looked after it. Loads of people can come to see it with us. Um, and they... Uh, don't really have questions about the money. Yeah, is it profitable for them? Hugely. Is it? Hugely. Well, they get it, it's about 10 euros per person to go and visit it. To look at it. And of course, when you go and look at it, you only see two pages. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We couldn't ask to see the signature of. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, d I don't think uh, they, might, they might have a problem with showing you that. That might have been a problem. My memory of going to see the Book of Kells was that it was in a chub, safe, air-conditioned room, etc. So, like, presumably the care of such a manuscript, like, uh, needs to be professional. And also yes. the security risk as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, like we saw Evie Home pick the Stations of the Cross yeah. lifted at the weekend. Mm. Mm. Amongst other items which were probably lifted for their metal, if nothing else. Um, um, so so security is really an issue and the yeah. care. But, and in fairness, uh, I'm a little concerned when you talk about the Irish people because that's almost a suggestion Trinity somehow isn't Irish. Uh, to um, some extent, it isn't. Uh, uh, in the sense that it was set up against the Irish people. Yeah, but it has changed quite a lot over the centuries. Yeah. And if you take it, uh, Trinity is actually the most independent university in the country. It's act the major decisions are made by its faculty, whereas in UCD and others, the major decisions are being made by businesses. So mm -hmm. my way of reckoning, I bring school children to see the book yeah. every, every springtime, mm -hmm. and there's no charge whatsoever for the primary school kids going in. No charge whatsoever yeah. at any time of the year. I bring them. I know sometimes you see in a notice it's only up till April, mm -hmm. but they actually don't pay attention to that. They let you in no matter what you bring them May or June. It's okay. The other aspect is probably one of the best Irish language faculties in the world. And it fostered scholars like Martin O'Kine when nobody else would take him in. 
the greatest uh, writer in the Irish language, equivalent to Joyce, probably in English, who wrote Crane and Killian. And, uh, you know, for to give Martin a job when nobody else would, as lecturer and then as professor in the university, he also fo fostered other Irish scholars like Moray Niwaki, who translated great Russian works into Irish. I'm not disputing any of that. Mm. And what I'm, my argument is not about saying that uh, Trinity College is an only odious institution. My son went to Trinity, my uncle went to Trinity, two of my ancestors went there in the 19th century, and my ancestor John Philpott Curran was at Trinity in 1750. Mm -hmm. He got into trouble with the Dean of Discipline. He was called up before the Dean of Discipline and said, we understand you've been having idle women in your rooms. <laughs> to which he said, when they were with me, they weren't on. <laughs> Robert Emmett went to Trinity College. Wolf Tone went to Trinity College. Thomas Davis went to Trinity College. Lots of Irish Republicans went to Trinity College. There's no dispute about that. So do you not think they make good use of the, of the, the revenue? No, I think that's the that's because it was kept under wraps for about 300, 200 years. Whereas in Kells, both Kells have been taken out regularly and brought around the town in front of the great high crosses and the colour system of the high crosses mimicked the colour system of the thing. The Book of Sales is essentially don't forget, it's a sacred book, it's a gospel and to have it just in a library of course is to sterilise that. It sterilises that. Um, you, you simply, in the context that it is in now, it says, oh, well, this is a kind of, it's a work of art. It's not like the gospel. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not, I don't disagree with what you said, which are positive things. Um, uh, the, my feeling is that in this, in this, in this, now is like the time to, to think about the roots of our institutions and our societies, right? Our, our society, then, and say, this society is profoundly colonised to its toenails. And if we were to return the Book of Kells to the place where it was from for 800 years, wouldn't that be a very healing, positive thing to do? What about the safety issue? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's been kept safe. I mean, Kells is a small town, isn't it? Well, Kells yeah. is a small town, but you could, it, don't, it was quite safe there for 800 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could, you could work out a system. First of all, before it could, I, let me put it like this, that before the book could go back there, a, safe, a, a system of safety and security that satisfied, say, a Doyle Committee would have to be in place. There's no doubt about that, and nobody in Kells would dispute that. So but are they in a position to build it? We hope to be. We hope to be in a position. So I just remind the people here that the U Lane collection, right, which is how it's been known in the municipal gallery, <coughs> I, I, my, my understanding is that we went down in a part of time, was it Reverend Ship? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, he gave all the paintings to Ireland right mm -hmm. now. We didn't all just be having the place to put them. Exactly. So London, as you know, shares half of them. Yeah. And I thought it was like imagining things once in a while. I was in London, yeah. I saw a painting there that they knew was in the municipal. Of course. They swapped them out every so many months. Mm -hmm. Right. But like we didn't spend our money, the politicians at the time did not want to put their fingers, you know, into the copper to spend on art, you know, because yes. art is not well, you know, we don't see ourselves as a visually sophisticated country. We might be literally in the literary sphere, but I'm wondering, will there be support for this? I mean it's not a bad idea moving it to cows. It's not a bad idea. Even loaning it to cows for X amount of months a year or something by way of compromise or something like that. I don't know. But I mean it sounds good, but Will people spend the money as the gentleman said on the security aspects on oh, other presenting it mm. in a proper way, which would But that's I mean it, it would be it, it, it would be it would be, to use a legal phrase, it would be common case. Both sides of this argument would agree on that, do you know what I mean? That you would say you can't have that book and yet you have a proper place for it. And I'd say of course you can't. I mean in a sense the question doesn't arise until either such a place is built, or else a credible plan for such a place is in existence. If such a if a plan was in existence and was getting support, then I believe Trinity would have to say, 
we've looked at this, we see the support that's there. Once that system is built, we're going to we're going to give back the book. Okay. Even the other day I was at a bit saying, Where would you put the Ardal Chalice? The Ardal Chalice is in the National Museum. Yeah, why shouldn't it be in Ardal? Or the Dernal Flan Chalice be in Dernal Flan? Or Lismore Because there's, there's no. You might say, well, perhaps it should. But that, for the moment, there's no, there's no context, contest in relation to that, that I'm aware of. Have you got to open the plug yet? Yes. But here's something else. There's a lot, if, if, if you could bear with me for one more story. Yes. Um, here's here's a, my favourite story about uh, Colin Killer. In the national, in the, in, I believe that Kells should also seek to recover. The Cahawk of Colum Kill is this. It's really the manuscript that we believe he wrote, the Psalms that he wrote, right? It seems that we have them in the Royal Irish Academy. There's a wonderful story about this, which I, which I love, which is this, that in the Cahawk was, it's, it's called, it's in Irish, it's called the Battle Book. And it was, the, in a sense, the Battle Book of the O'Donnells. Before the O'Donnells went into battle, they did that quite frequently. Um, a priest would go around the army, anti-clockwise, with the cock under his arm and bless them with it. Okay? So it was like a talisman. And in uh, 1690, don't forget the, the Book of Kells goes to Trinity in around 1650. In 1690, we have the Siege of Limerick. And we have the end of the, the Jacobite cause and many of the army go to France. Daniel O'Donnell, not the singer, his ancestor, <laughs> a colonel, um, brings with him the cock to France, right? And wonderfully, he goes into battle, now a kind of a more modern, high-tech battle than he'd been in, with the French army. He fights against Churchill's ancestor, the Duke of Marlborough at the Siege of Oudenard, he becomes a veteran. He always wins. It seems the Cahawk works. He doesn't lose. And ultimately, uh, he, he hands the Cahawk over to Irish nuns in Louvain, asks them to look after it. It's brought back to, the Cahawk is brought back to Dublin, or to Ireland, by one of the O'Donnells of Newport County, Mayo, because a special family had to look after the Cahawk. It had been there since the 6th century. And they opened it up and they found the Psalms that Colum Killer, well, it's possible that it was the Psalms that Colum Killer wrote in St. Finian's. It's in the Magistule script of Irish. I have a picture of it on. Um, oops. That's it there. So it's been in, it's been in this for maybe, what, uh, over a thousand years. The very thing that Colin Killer wrote, the copyright, the first copy that Fidian refused and that Colin Killer threw over the High King to defend his right to do it. Mm. And we have that in the Royal mm. If that in any other view? Oh yeah. You don't it doesn't cost anything to view, by the way. Mm. In any other country, in my humble opinion, you'd have an intellectual property foundation built around that with people coming from all over the world. <laughs> you didn't give us a cost for safekeeping and um, storage or, you know, the environment for the book of Kells in Kells. I will give you X to the power of yeah. all. And like, I don't know. Yeah, but let's... Of course, before, let me get right. You're spot on. A serious proposal, but of course, have to come do that. If you have to have a business plan, you have to say how much money are you, if you're going to put this on display, how much money are you going to get? you to sponsor it? We're kind of working on those things, but you're, you're, of course, you're, that's a really good question. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's the deal breaker, you know, because Trinity already have spent the money, it's secure, it's in, in an environment. I don't think it's realistic that it would be any more viewable. Uh, parading it around as a relic nowadays mm -hmm. and, and probably more kids get to see it in its present location etc. That's true. Um, you mentioned there about the Muslim and the Chinese not having um, uh, 
an appreciation of copyright law and I would say this generation within this new uh, millennium with the internet uh, again we can see the the weakening of of, of, um, of copyright yeah. and yet when so many people rely on it to make their intellectual yeah. living so to speak mm. um, and yet this morning I heard of some child who was born without kidneys or something and the mother was able to read a paper by a, a French doctor on, on um, apparently their, their muscles, their nerves weren't developed and the mm. child didn't communicate at all. Yeah. Uh, and the thought it was a brain thing but it was purely a physical thing. Um, so it, it's interesting just to watch how things, and you see all these old bands coming out and playing in stadia because they can't get any money on royalties. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd imagine even apps, etc., you know, kind of technology in general. It's, it's, it, I think the, the, you make very good points then, mm. you know what I mean? Um, it's interesting that the, and it's not, I mean, the Chinese and Muslim countries are, or have been, certainly the Chinese have been yielding to um, basically what's pressure from the Americans. Um, America gets more money from intellectual property than anything else, and from films, records, and computer programs. But for how much longer is my question. You see, if you yeah, take something like that. It's not going to go on forever. It's, again, no. it's, and, and, and even now, it, it's, it's, um, it's uh, stopping. Yeah. I mean, the. the uh, I mean, sorry, I'm cutting across here briefly. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, in the recently, in the, the case from the High Court that um, I referred to, was the judgment of Mr. Justice Peter Charles. And he was hearing an application by music companies to have to force internet providers like BBC to block access to people that they said were infringing their copyright. Okay? And he was asked to give the order under, broadly speaking, European law and Irish law. And he said he, he couldn't, but in the course of his judgment, he said, Ireland has had a copyright law since Colin Kim's time. Of course, to me, that was man of heaven. Because what the critics had said was, oh, this is Irish stuff. But, you know, what's the bread of law? You know, they would always get the case wrong if they got it. So he got it right and said, no, we've had a copyright law since then. That means that the book of Celts was taken under that law. Copyright. I quite agree. I think Colin Killer's position is kind of closer to the internet position. The internet proposes that actually all the knowledge should be widely. That's what it says. And there's really a strong argument for that. So I, I could go on as you can see. So I'll, I'll zip up there. <laughs> the 400th anniversary of Trinity College, uh, Thomas Mitchell got 400 copies of the book of Kells made. Mm. And they think they cost either 4,000 or 40,000. And it was a money making exercise yeah. spread throughout the world. Yeah. Who gave them the rights and where did the copyright, where did the, the coppers go? They went to Trinity College, you may be sure. It wasn't like Colin Killick when he says, when I, if I made any profit from this exercise of copying, it would go to the people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did it? I, didn't, I don't think so. I wrote a letter to one of the sorry, like, no. Go ahead. <laughs> well, my mention in regards to what William was saying with the internet there, that uh, the pages of the Book of Cows are available freely <laughs> on, on mm -hmm. the internet now yeah. at tcd.ie. Mm -hmm. um, so, like I mean, it is made available free in that respect. Yeah. And maybe you get to see a lot more of it than if you pay your 10 euro in or whatever. Well, you know. part, of one of the, the, uh, <coughs> part of the exercise towards getting the book of back to Kells, where we have a plan to cover the, 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 the oval borderline of the Kells monastery is still there. It means that it's a lot older than Dublin, just by miles. <laughs> it's this, this incredible medieval town is there. And uh, um, a friend of mine in architect has a plan to get a facsimile of the book of Kells and to put it, put pages all around, right? So that you can see the whole book of Kells in Kells. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
What sort of things does it say in the book? It's the gospel. It says like like St. John's Gospel. Interpretation of the gospel. Yeah. Mary. It's not no, it's not an interpretation, it's the gospel. I mean, it's, it's, it gives the words of the gospel in Latin. In regards to Kav, um, I think the, the um, again it brought school children in there to see the Kav and to see the Solar the Mass Book of Tala. Um, and again it's free and the staff always make it very clear that they're custodians uh, on behalf of the people of Ireland that are actually employees of the people of Ireland and that the, to view these books uh, it's, it's available to any any person or any group at any time on request. Mm. They're kept in the vault quite a lot of the time. But the, the Cahoc was beautifully restored, uh, I think about 20 years ago. Yeah. And you might know the story that when the restorer went to match up uh, pages of vellum, he could not find a match till he got vellum from the calves of County Meath. <laughs> That's really that, is the, that is the truth. Uh, he could not. He could not match the film uh, until he got film from the cows of County Mead, and that, that's what it's placed on now uh, in the restored right. version. But right. that's a lovely story. Yes. Uh, about um, and maybe they ask Denise to be guardian of that, since she she has defended the intellectual property rights of the mm. ladies of the mm. against Disney. Mm -hmm. I think she deserves some support. Yeah. But um, <coughs> I would like to see in. Uh, um, in the institute that we envisage for Kells is I'd love to see the Book of Kells. I'd also love to see the Kahak. If you've got the gospel and you've got the law and you've got the art, you've got a civilization, isn't it? And those are the elements of a civilization. Old Irish people, first of all, Irish children especially, could see, well, you know, this country was a civilization. Isn't that important? Um, defenses to a, a copyright claim is to say that it's a matter of public interest. It's in the public's interest to have this. So although you have copyright, you're not going to enforce it. Um, in Colin Kiddis' case, with, with um, Finian and the Sams, I didn't go into all this here, but um, the Sams were fundamental to Irish education in those days. The oldest piece of Irish writing we have is somebody copying out the Sams. We have it from Andrew. So, if Finian had been able to stop copying the soldier, he would have controlled education. It's in the public interest not to have one person control. He was the Disney of the day, was he? Yes! <laughs> Worse! And he was from Mullingar. He was the Joe Dolan of copyright point supply to what they have in the Chester I mean, Beach. What was the copyright law of Syria in the, in the, in the 10th century? Would you be rushing to return something? No. And that is not the sad reality. And we're also using the norms of our age to judge a previous generation as well. And you have to be very careful about that. Yeah, you can't do that. No, no. Which I say one final story. The last. Oh. <laughs> At Trinity, are three statues, all made by my uncle John and Fully, who for some reason also made golf in the Phoenix Park. I don't know why. And one of the statues is of Edmund Burke, of course, who is the in a way, the real Trinity star. Edmund Burke was born on Inns Key, Aaron, Aaron Key, Inns Key Ward. Uh, in like the 1720s or 30s or whatever. And his father was Church of Ireland and Edmund became Church of Ireland. But his cousins, the Nagels of Tipperary, were Catholics. And one of his ancestors had been the Attorney General under James II or something like that. So, the chances are that since given that Edmund did a lot of his time a affirming Catholic emancipation, 
as indeed lots of did too. This is not an anti-Protestant statement. Um, so he he proceeded from there, and uh, uh, in that parish right now is a, is, a, is a place called George's Hill, and there's a convent there, which is the oldest Catholic school in Dublin by a mile. It was founded by a woman called Teresa Mullally, who just had, had was trying to put something together for poor Catholic girls in the area. But she had to be careful of informers. Nowadays, if you think of the word informer, we mm -hmm. uh, In those days, if you were running a Catholic school, the informer was the person who told the authorities, mm -hmm. what happened to you? You went to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. You went into slavery forever. So, in a sense, you could say, in the 18th century, Trinity was in charge of a system of education that could only be uh, uh, represented as, what's the name of the guy who was the governor of California? Um, Schwarzenegger. Yeah. We like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Educate, eradicate. Educate, eradicate. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, the school's still there. And Teresa triumphed in the end with the help of Edmund Burke's sister. Our aunt, uh, Miss Nagel, said, found the presentation nuns. And uh, it's to, if you go in there, it's beautiful. It's, it's not part of that Dublin tourist. But the nuns, they have a little, little museum of their own, with a lot of their own um, uh, documents, you know, letters and things, outlining their struggle as to how they you know, this institution for the young Catholic girls of that parish. Where is that? Where is that? It's, um, it's just behind the, the, near the markets. Yeah. It's, it's near Green Street. Mm -hmm. Cable Street. Yeah. Uh, well, Cable Street. Street. Yeah. And so it's a, yeah. So that's yeah. where, in a sense, it, we, it's, it's, although he's not mentioned, it's likely that Edmund Burke had a hand in that. But he was making his contribution to. to Big political issues. Uh, there was one law case that uh, survives of that time where a Catholic school teacher is indeed convicted and is sent off to the Barbados. So that's where we're coming from. Did you ever speculate if Trinity hadn't looked up for the last 400 years, where would it be now? The British Museum. <laughs> <laughs> Even worse. <laughs> And it might have been, in, it might have been with, the, with the, the Irish nuns in Nouvelle, the, yeah. the, Colic, the other relic of Colic. Good question. The Sanctus. Of course, Trinity did go down. And the book is preserved. And we, we have something to argue about. Which we might have that. <coughs> no contest on that point. What effect would it have on Trinity if that came to pass? It's a good question. Many people that I know in Trinity, and I do some work with their part of their law department and another department, many people in Trinity are fed up with the Book of Kells because they say this is trying to be a serious university. It's not supposed to be a tourist place. Yeah. We, we know we stole the Book of Kells. It's mm -hmm. patent. You don't have to be a genius to the whole story. It's a complete fabrication. It's, they're keeping it there to get money. So a lot of people in Kells would be. Sorry. <laughs> In Trinity, it would be pleased to see them. Um, does that answer your question? It's a half answer. Um, I think that they would be sorry to see, because they see they've, they've made in a sense, the mistake of identifying the college with the book. Yeah. Yes. And of course, they like the money as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they would be hard pushed to, to, to let it go. But Irish people, people, if that is our book, we say where it goes. Patrick Pierce, the sovereign people. Yeah, it, at one stage, it was worth between eight and ten million a year, and that was a very conservative estimate mm. to the college. Mm. The Another thing Sorry. was, they, if it was a private coach owner, they wouldn't be let do it because they break the traffic laws. They all the coaches yeah. park on double yellow lines. They have no place to park coaches. You can't park a coach outside the National Museum. Mm. I mean, they ride roughshod over everybody. It's also ironic that I think I did it. 
By the way, I have to say that I, I run um, two impoverished organisations which derive from Trinity. One is the Latin Dublin branch is called the Punto Robert Dennett. Would you think Robert Dennett was associated with Latin? When Robert Dennett was leaving Kilmainham jail for his trial in Green Street, he turned around to his cousin Mason, who was in the next cell, and he quoted the Aeneid to him. He says, Inutrum quae paratus. I'm ready for either outcome, which means like life or death. So I thought it would be nice to commemorate Robert. And the other is to do with um, his putative father-in-law, John Fulbot Kern, who's a nasty piece of work, as we know. <laughs> if Trinity... Uh, so Tr Trinity is a complex place with different strands in it. I think Trinity, personally, would be better off without the Book of Kells. It's stultifying for them. This is supposed to be a modern university. But obviously, I, by the same time, I also, I also realize that there are good arguments um, for saying that the Book of Kells should stay there. That there are good arguments for that. Is that it? Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Remind your folks again, it's coming on mobile phones, don't have any points there when you get home. And also, um, just a little donation box in the back of the hall. We already have a bookmark ready for you for a, a, an extensive ser uh, series of lectures. I'm sure you'll enjoy next year. Uh, we'll be very, very shortly. Very shortly. Well, hands are well on the way. Thanks very much. Oh, Thank you.